Greetings and welcome to uh, another lecture. Uh, today uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, Alice Munro's To Reach Japan. Um, I, uh, you know, on a personal level, really enjoyed this short story. I remember reading it uh, a while back uh, after kind of hearing about um, her and her work. Uh, and I forget exactly where I read it. Um, I think I bought her book and read a couple of stories out of it. And it was the first story in her book, uh, Dear Life. And it just really stuck with me, especially uh, the scene where the, uh, her child, um, Katie, uh, is in between those two train cars and that's where she finds her. And for me, that uh, image, I would imagine, just like the uh, protagonist in the piece, uh, always stuck with me. And so we'll do some analysis on this. Um, you know, a couple questions right off the bat here. Um, I think mostly what I'll do is I'll just jump right into the text here today uh, as I've you know really annotated the heck out of this piece uh, and we can kind of go through it page by page but a, a couple of questions I can ask right off the bat is um, the first one is interesting uh, usually when we think of poetry uh, we have this kind of romantic notion uh, of, of what it is uh, the process of writing it, uh, writing it uh, what it means to us um, not only as individuals but kind of its contributions uh, to a society as well um, but I do think that one of the uh, pieces of social commentary that's uh, in To Reach Japan is that we have to be a little careful uh, because uh, poetry might uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, hit this line of self-indulgence uh, and it kind of takes us away from other responsibilities. So I'm speaking at large uh, to the text, but I think that's a major point. So one of the questions I do have here early on, uh, and this is kind of more just a, you know, an opinion-based question, is poetry or the act of writing poetry, is it an act of giving? Are you actually giving something to the world through this kind of poetic enterprise? Or is it rather uh, the complete <clears throat> opposite of that, but an, an act of selfishness? Um, so is it an act of giving or is it actually there's something very self-indulgent uh, about it and it's actually an act of uh, selfishness? Now, almost parallel uh, to the protagonist, uh, Greta, her, her need uh, to write this poetry and be involved in this world of, of people who write poetry, um, almost sidled up right next to it is this idea of adultery, uh, cheating on her husband, uh, which she uh, actually does. Um, she does kind of follow through with the act later on in the story, and of course we know she kind of uh, flirts with it, uh, flirts with the idea of cheating on her husband um, after that poetry party. But I guess one of the questions I have, again, uh, generally speaking, is, is, alter is adultery a requirement for Greta, or does it kind of represent um, her problematic nature, uh, a character flaw, uh, and something that needs to be corrected, or is it necessary? Um, you know, I think, you know, yes, the after-school special uh, theme would be don't, you know, cheat on your husband or wife, but we have to recognize that for some people uh, it is uh, a viable option, uh, maybe it's their only option, um, so we got to be a little bit open-minded uh, about it. Um, Let's get right into it. Uh, so we look up some symbolism here uh, early on, uh, and Peter uh, actually translates to stone and rock. Uh, I've mentioned this before in previous lectures, but I do think it's a good idea to look up the meaning of names, uh, because what it essentially does is it kind of clues you in uh, to ideas that pertain to those characters or pertains to uh, events that that character is involved with. So I think it's a very good habit, and they seem to work there's not a lot of names to look up in this text, uh, but they seem to work. Uh, so Peter is stone and rock. And I think that's pretty viable uh, in the sense that he is a very reliable, consistent character. He is a reliable father. Uh, he is a reliable uh, earner uh, as far as the family income is concerned. Uh, and he's likened to having um, uh, a, a mind of practicality, uh, whereas Greta is the one who is uh, a little bit more radical uh, in her ideologies, uh, a little bit more idealistic, whereas Peter is uh, definitely a realist. So there's a major contrast uh, between the husband and the wife here. Uh, Greta uh, translates to pearl, uh, something that's kind of sought after, right? So. Uh, I'm not sure how usable that one is, but the next one, uh, Katie, the daughter, <clears throat> is pure and clear. Uh, and that one, you know, especially as a child who is a constant reminder of 
Greta's family obligations, right? Trying to keep her pure in that respect. Uh, trying to keep her uh, a mom who is careful of her duties as a mother. Uh, she does represent purity and clearness, right? So it's funny how the way this begins is very similar to the way this ends. Um, eventually we're talking about this kind of, uh, you know, we're on a train. So let me just read a little bit here. Uh, this is right on the first page of the uh, short story, the PDF that we have. He says, uh, the narrator states, his smile, and this is of course Peter, his smile for their daughter Katie was wide open, sunny, without a doubt in the world, as if he believed that she would continue to be a marvel to him and he to her forever. So there's a pretty uh, miraculous uh, relationship that uh, Peter and Katie seem to share here, right? That the marvel uh, of their relationship would never relent, it would never give up. It goes on to say, the smile for his wife seemed hopeful and trusting. Well, we do know that throughout this text and what Greta goes through, um, the conflicts that she goes through, it's going to be very important that Peter remain hopeful and trusting of his wife because her hope and trust and you know, all of this is going to be challenged uh, quite a bit. Uh, it goes on to say, something that could not easily be put into words and indeed might never be. Um, there is some exposition given about Peter, uh, that he comes from Soviet Czechoslovakia uh, in Western Europe. Uh, you know, I would imagine you can kind of plug in that sense of kind of history uh, and culture and region into, uh, you know, more or less uh, his characterization. Uh, maybe that is a big part of his practicality. Uh, we know that uh, we also get some exposition about his mother. Uh, so Greta's uh, mother-in-law, and they seem to have a pretty, I wouldn't say strained relationship, but it seems to be a little bit distant. Um, Peter's mother doesn't really get readily involved and help uh, Greta, and she definitely comments on that. So if I could backtrack a, a quick second, the first few sentences is interesting. Once Peter had brought Greta's suitcase on board the train, he seemed eager to get himself out of the way, but not to leave. Now, I, when I analyze these stories, I speak in complete totality, right, from beginning to end. Notice that he, he's, he's, he wants to get himself out of the way, but he doesn't want to leave entirely. This is the exact situation of Katie at the end of the text, uh, when the man arrives, uh, and his name, I could just remind myself, of course. I think it's Harris, right? Harris Bennett. When Harris Bennett arrives, that's the same kind of posturing that Katie takes on. She doesn't want to get in the way of uh, Greta uh, and this man, uh, Harris Bennett. Uh, but at the same time, it does mention explicitly that she doesn't want to leave either. So it's this idea of like, okay, fine, I'll get out of your way. Uh, I know that there's something here that is very important to you, um, but I'm not going to leave entirely. I'm not just going to walk away here. The husband does the same thing. Now, this is essentially a kind of a theme, right? Where if we're talking about relationships, I will give you the space that you need. I will give you the space that you need to explore, uh, to kind of deal with your own problems, to even kind of experiment and take risks uh, if necessary. But rest assured, I will not leave. Notice that Peter and Katie in that respect are the rock uh, and they are uh, this idea of stone, right? Something that you can rely on, something that's very kind of, you know, concrete uh, uh, and something you can always rely on, basically. Okay, very good, moving on. So this is interesting. This one almost kind of strikes you as odd. So on the right at the top of page two, um, Greta is talking to Peter about you know escaping uh, uh, communist Soviet Union and and, and, and uh, you know trying to kind of get into kind of free uh, you know regions and countries uh, in Eastern and Western Europe. And Greta says, I, she, "I'll just read the quote. I've read stories like that." Greta said when Peter first told her about this. She explained how in the stories the baby would start to cry and invariably had to be smothered or strangled so the noise wouldn't endanger the whole legal party. Now, even on a very literal level, that's pretty intense, right? The idea that you're trying to escape uh, and you have to be incredibly quiet, you have a group of people around you. So it's not just about you, that's the first thing. It's not just about you and your little baby and your little family. You have an entire kind of collective that you have to uh, keep in mind and kind of you know work with. So this 
on a literal level, this idea that a baby would start to cry and you would actually have to smother or strangle that child in order to not reveal uh, the whereabouts uh, or give up everybody's location is intense, right? You talk about um, having to kind of uh, do away with uh, notions of, of, of self-interest uh, uh, and self-preservation to have to kill your own baby, right? So that the entire group survives. Now, this is, uh, this is relatable to uh, Kate, uh, Greta in many respects. Greta is the baby who just wants to cry and cry and cry. And her version of crying is, I'm not a satisfied woman. Uh, I'm not satisfied with my humdrum domestic existence of just being a housewife. I want to be a poet. I want to be involved and in, uh, uh, surrounded by interesting poetic people. My husband is not fulfilling my desires. Um, I'm speaking in totality of the text just so we can, you know, uh, get a sense of things. Um, my husband is not fulfilling my sense of idealism and romanticism, and therefore I have to go outside this very kind of practical marriage and this practical arrangement, and I have to find it elsewhere. Notice that her self-indulgence as far as what she, this need to escape her domestic uh, housewife responsibilities or this role that she has is directly linked to this idea of being a poet and surrounding herself by poetic type of people. So poetry is essentially cheating, right? And she comes to recognize this by the end of the text. For her, the act of writing poetry is not just, you know, being creative and, uh, you know, writing a poem and sharing it with the world. Uh, it is to essentially, to write a poem for her or to kind of engage in the act of uh, poetry uh, is to essentially uh, be a form of infidelity and to cheat on her wife because it's taking her out, or cheat on her husband and her child, Katie, because it's taking her outside of her responsibility, responsibilities uh, as a, as a uh, wife and as a, a person who is a, a part of this home. So there, there's profound implications of what it means to chase this idea of poetry or this poetic livelihood or this dream that she is doing. Okay. Um, so, you know, this idea that you're going to strangle that child, well, and smother her, which is essentially to silence the noise and to silence the fussing and to science, silence the restlessness. I think what Katie will recognize by the end of this text in, in very abrupt ways is, uh, subtle and abrupt ways, uh, is that she is that child that also must be smothered in order to save the entire family. These poetic indulgences and aspirations that she has, which is taking her outside of her marriage, they must be stifled, they must be um, smothered so that this family can continue on in a very practical way. Pretty interesting ideas. Uh, moving on. I mentioned the mom. I won't say much about her, but she, uh, it does mention that, uh, and this is of course a first person narration, so it's coming from Greta, but um, it says that she surpassed um, Greta in every kind of way. She surpasses Greta in every household skill and essentially puts her to shame. And on top of that, she doesn't really help. She's not the kind of mother-in-law who says, let me help you with this. Let me teach you this. Um, she uh, basically just kind of keeps this distance and lets Greta kind of uh, um, struggle uh, and potentially fail on her own. Now, of course, there's uh, merits to that. And of course, there's uh, disadvantages and, and things that you could say, you know, hey, give me a helping hand, right? But that's the way it goes. Uh, let's see here. So here's a clear contrast between Greta and Peter. Uh, this is on the middle of page two. It does mention that she, this is Greta, she avoided anything useful like the plague. So if anything was kind of pragmatic and practical and just you know generally useful, she avoids it. Uh, she wants things that, uh, or, or to engage in things that are not useful. You know, in many, you know, what is Peter? Peter is an engineer, right? Uh, and that's why we get into this discussion and this motif of bridges in a little bit. Um, it, it's almost a, in some respects, a, a kind of neoliberalist, uh, neoliberalistic mindset, which is to say, you know, the, the field of poetry and, and writing poetry and sharing poetry and publishing poetry, it's not doing the world any good in either a scientific or kind of economic uh, way, right? Yes, maybe we're helping people out. Um, Bottom of page two, uh, it's, uh, I'm just gonna read this paragraph. 
His opinions were something like his complexion. Of course, we're talking about Peter. When they went to see a movie, he never wanted to talk about it afterward. He would say that it was good or pretty good or okay. He didn't see the point in going further. He watched television. He read a book in somewhat the same way. He had patience with such things, and I think that's a key word here, which is patience, right? The people who put them together were probably doing the best they could. Greta used to argue, rashly asking whether he would say the same thing about a bridge. The people who did it, uh, the people who did uh, it did their best, but their best was not good enough, so it fell down. This is very interesting, right? You have Peter and Greta, who are essentially almost crossing paths and kind of discussing a uh, subject matter that is very specific to their expertise, right? So in the first part of this paragraph, it, we're focused in on Peter, and Peter doesn't pass judgments on books and movies and things of that nature. Uh, his attitude is, well, that's the best that these people could do. The people who created that work, that's the best that they could do, and so why say anything, right? Have patience. Whereas then Greta kind of crosses over and starts talking about a bridge, uh, which obviously falls under the kind of category of uh, an engineer, right? Their expertise. And there she tries to challenge Peter on that notion that good is good enough if we're talking about a bridge. Can you say that, according to Greta, she says, can you say that about a bridge? Can a bridge just be good enough? Well, shouldn't it be the best that it can be? Uh, shouldn't we keep pushing and striving for the best bridge that we can get uh, in, and to, to essentially challenge his argument that good is essentially good enough? So this is the first major, I wouldn't say the first motif, but probably the first major motif that we see carried throughout the entire text. And we have to think about it on a figurative level, which is a bridge, right? And I think the best way to think about a bridge early on in this text is essentially the relationship or the marriage between Peter and Greta, right? It's a bridge that we have between them. And you have two different perspectives on this bridge, or in other words, this marriage. Peter saying, well, yeah, uh, let's have patience. Good is good enough. This is, uh, it's a good marriage. Let's just be happy that it's a good marriage. It's a practical marriage. It works. Um, it's not gonna fall down here, right? Let's just be happy. Whereas Greta is trying to kind of push the envelope, so to speak, uh, to uh, make this bridge even better. And that's where we get into this insatiable attitude that she has toward the relationship, right? That good is not good enough. Now again, on a, on a, on a kind of readership level, right, when we think about the story as readers, you can have opinions. Um, when you think about relationships in your life, maybe some of you are married, some of, maybe if you have significant others, um, or even if you think about relationships with parents, uh, etc., uh, guardians, are we just happy that the relationships are good and we should just be patient and kind of leave it at that? Because there is some virtue to that, right? Or should we be always trying to push these relationships to their utmost potential, um, even though that might lead to a, a sense of discomfort uh, and, and maybe even risk taking? Um, now, the bridge, we'll get a literal bridge later on in the text, uh, essentially, uh, probably in a couple uh, instances, uh, actually, but the most notable one is at the end when we find Katie in between the two train cars on that very shaky platform, right, where it's all noisy and bumpy, and that's essentially the bridge there, right? And I'm speaking in totality of the text, which I always do uh, in these lectures. Um, Notice that even though Katie is bouncing around and it's loud and it's noisy and it's uncomfortable in that kind of bridge area, she stays quiet. Uh, she essentially uh, kind of bears through it instead of crying out and screaming. In fact, she doesn't even cry until she sees her mother. Then she starts to kind of bawl and let the tears uh, and let the tears out and the, and the kind of, you know, the screeching and the ranting uh, kind of begins for her. Uh, but Katie, who is probably more mature than her mother in these types of respects, the idea of bearing through uh, restlessness, um, expressing patience just like her father, right? Maybe that's why in the beginning of this text there's such a tight relationship uh, and in a, a kind of miraculous relationship that is presented between Peter uh, and his daughter Katie here, okay? But keep in mind the motif uh, of the bridge. Um, it's mentioned here, we're given perspectives on this idea of a relationship probably, uh, and then we can see this kind of taken forward here, okay. There 
is definitely some kind of gender uh, uh, issues uh, explored in this text. Uh, what's the difference between a poet and a poetess? Uh, a poetess I, uh, obviously is kind of the female version of a poet, but do we really even need to distinguish between a poet and a poetess? Uh, it is Peter's mother uh, who does feel the need, and so she always likens uh, Greta to a poetess. Okay. Um, Another idea here is, you know, when we talk about the, Im the, the impracticality of being a poet, right? It's kind of frivolous, uh, it's pointless, uh, it's a time filler, uh, and at the same time it's a waste, and then paradoxically it's, it's a waste of time. So we can, we can say a lot of negative things about poetry because from a practical sense, uh, you know, where Peter's coming from and definitely where Peter's mother is coming from, who passes this type of silent judgment, um, we can be pretty critical of the idea of poetry. Um, but it's, the idea here is that, okay, you're a housewife, which means that beyond your motherly responsibilities and your kind of duties as far as the family is concerned, what else are you doing to occupy your time? And I think what's mentioned here is the way that Peter's mom sees it, and, and therefore because of the influence Peter himself, will let her do this poetry stuff, right? Uh, in the, the, uh, the protagonist, uh, Greta, I think it's mentioned she's published a, a couple times uh, in, in a couple journals, so she's kind of like a fledgling poet uh, just on the, uh, the periphery uh, of this established kind of writer's circle, uh, and she wants her way in. And the way to th that she's kind of victimizing herself, uh, I would imagine, through some of this narration, and the idea is that, well, if I'm just a domestic housewife, I need something more. So, so we'll give you, right? We'll grant you this idea uh, of exploring or pursuing poetry, right? Because of these kind of unshakable, uh, unrelenting domestic responsibilities, let's give you this sense of indulgence. You can indulge in this uh, act of poetry, okay? Now, a couple things here about the idea of poetry, and I actually have a master's in poetry, so I can relate to uh, some of these ideas. One thing, um, we do understand that Peter can be incredibly critical of her profession, uh, poet, uh, as it is not good enough and highly impractical, right? So we, we just already mentioned that. No sense rehashing that point. However, uh, the second point I want to make here, when you do write poetry, you know, going back to Peter, Peter, Peter builds a bridge, or Peter construct something as an engineer, it's there, it, it works, it's good enough, right? Use it. Use it into, uh, you know, uh, perpetuity, right? It's good enough. But as a poet, especially when we, we get involved with this idea of expression, good is not good enough. You're always trying to write the perfect poem. You're always trying to uh, essentially compose the perfect emotion or the perfect experience which incites uh, the, the, most, you know, the clearest emotions as you have a kind of connection to the reader. So it goes without saying that when we talk about art, good is never good enough, or at least that's one way of looking at it, that we're always trying to find some level of uh, perfection or at least make very steady, gainful strides in that direction right, of perfection. Um, so her feelings about poetry we do understand uh, on a interpretive level also reflect her feelings about this relationship and about this marriage. Um, okay, very good. We're definitely getting involved in this story. It's one of um, uh, Alice Munro's, you know, probably a one, one point of her agenda is to explore ideas of feminism. And this is happening on page three uh, in the middle paragraph starting with Quote, it's hard to explain it to anybody now, the life of woman at that time. What was okay and what was not? You might say, well, feminism was not. Feminism, at least in the, the context that she's providing here, was kind of looked down upon. Feminism, which is kind of uh, uh, breaking the restraints of domestic responsibilities, breaking the restraints of a kind of social norms for women, uh, was looked down upon uh, within the context that she's providing here, right? Um, couple lines in, it was the way any serious idea, let alone ambition, was seen as some sort of crime against nature. You're a woman, you're ambitious, oh my goodness, that's a crime against nature, meaning it's taking you away from your womanly responsibilities or your motherly responsibilities or your domestic responsibilities in the home. So if you get, amb if you get ambitious and you want to kind of move outside of that, 
um, then people can kind of you know criticize you uh, and and definitely say you are to blame uh, in some respects. Now this is a tough issue. Um, I think here we are on page three and. Greta wholeheartedly believes that she is kind of persecuted in, in, in this way, that she is restricted from pursuing her own ambitions. But by the end of the text, we do understand that look what her ambitions have gotten her. Uh, this guy, uh, Harris Bennett, uh, showing up at the tra sta train station after she's had a tumultuous uh, and uh, I would imagine uh, a kind of catharsis of some of some kind uh, with her relationship uh, with Greg, I believe, uh, on the train. And now this guy is showing up uh, as if to capitulate on the relationship that she tried to ensue earlier in the text. But at that point, at the end of the story, she's totally forgotten about it. And she is very much dedicated to her family at that point. But lo and behold, here is this man. And it's a wonderful way to end the story. Uh, and that's the way short stories end. We just don't know what's going to happen. But what would happen? What is she going to say to that man? We understand that uh, Katie uh, kind of takes a step back, gives her the space, but Katie is not going nowhere. Very similar to Peter, uh, as he has described uh, in the beginning. Not going anywhere. A stone, a rock, right? Uh, as Peter's name describes. Okay, very good. So I think we can be a little critical of her feelings toward feminism and the kind of persecution uh, of feminism early in the text. So we're talking about issues of being a housewife. Can we break that role? Can we somehow uh, uh, escape that identity? So on page four, she is attending this, uh, this, this poetry party, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, there's a magazine called the, uh, the Echo Answers. And this is what she was, she had two poems published in this, the Echo Answers. I'm not sure if that's a real magazine or not. Uh, we, do get, uh, uh, we do get some films that are referenced here later on, uh, one called The 400 Blows, which is a French film. Uh, I am going to buy it because I, I've read about it and it sounds uh, like groundbreaking uh, uh, filmmaking, uh, but I'm trying to wait for a sale on that to be quite honest because it's, it's, you know, it's a little pricey right now for my taste. The Echo Answers, I'm not sure, I, I, never, I didn't reference this, I probably should have, but figuratively speaking, there is an echo that is answered by the end of this text, right? Uh, when you think about the experience she has with Harris Bennett uh, and the fact that he shows up at the very end of this text, almost like a, for, uh, almost uh, after he is forgotten, there is an echo that is essentially answered, right? She had a desire. Uh, that desire was essentially represented by her engaging in a kind of uh, momentary relationship with this man, uh, taking her outside of her marriage, taking her outside of, uh, I guess, her responsibilities to some degree uh, that she had for her family. She forgets about it, but the echo was answered by the end of the text. The crucial question is, what is how, how will she answer that echo, right? What will she, uh, how, how will she respond to this guy, uh, Harris, who shows up at the very end here? Um, midway through this paragraph on page four, she's really kind of dressing up, uh, totally kind of breaking her humdrum uh, uh, domestic identity. And it says here, she was wearing high heels which slowed her down considerably. Now, yes, literally, we understand that high heels slows a woman down. I read uh, the leisure, uh, the theory of the leisure class by uh, Thornstein Veblen, and he even talks about the whole idea of tight dresses and uh, dresses that constrain women, whether it be the bodice, uh, the 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 bodice, I'm probably saying that a little incorrectly, uh, the thing that cinches the woman's waist or really tight dresses or high heels. The whole point of those, he argues in this, this theory, is that they are supposed to slow women down, incapacitate them for manual labor, and essentially make them dependent on men, right? And I guess that's the idea. Now, we're not saying that a woman can't hold her own in a tight form fitting dress uh, and high heels, but the idea is that in some respects, it makes her dependent on a man. Uh, uh, and that's, that's you know, the whole point of it. Um, 
it back to the text here, it is slowing her down. So by dressing up and embodying uh, this image or idea of herself, it is slowing her down uh, considerably. Uh, and I think that's more figurative than it is literal. Uh, slowing her down in, in, in sense of maybe uh, providing for her family or being this kind of bedrock or this, uh, this foundation for her family. She's She's a little dumbfounded. Uh, she's a little, I guess you could say, slightly shocked and a little confused. And I'll just read my note here. This refuge of poetry, where we're supposed to have this kind of uh, sanctuary of poetry, uh, which she's so anticipating and wanting to be uh, included in. This refuge of poetry, she imagined, would have nothing to do with suburbia, which necessitates domestification of women. So I think she's a little shocked to see this, that this poetry party, you know, usually when we think of poetry and kind of uh, this, this idea of kind of living free and kind of freedom of mind, you think of like old school Greenwich Village uh, in New York City, where all kinds of artist types uh, are hanging out. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of done away with corporate America. Uh, it's, it's rid itself of these gender roles uh, that, uh, you know, uh, America has essentially been founded upon, not to mention, you know, countries, Western uh, nations throughout the world. She wasn't expecting just a, a suburban house in a suburban neighborhood. And even when we get involved, when we go into this house and we start to see things through her eyes, we notice that it's a lot of guys, it's a lot of men uh, who are essentially the kind of primary poets uh, uh, that are uh, a part of this world and the women are essentially just there to support the men. Uh, so I think she had a much different idea of what she was going to run into. It's almost like deflating uh, the dream that she had, uh, that she would be able to connect with women who are also breaking, uh, you know, uh, previous roles that were expected of them and kind of breaching and breaking into new ground. Not the case. So this is, uh, you know, a little bit um, disillusioning for her as she's saying that it's just a lot of men who are supported by these women, right? All right, very good. On to the next page. Some ideas here. So Greta is disillusioned to think that this poetry party is a place where she can express the yearned for virtues of her life. It doesn't seem so, and it is most likely a letdown uh, for her. So she finds a little bit of a connection, uh, and this is page five, top of page five. She finds a little bit of a connection to a teenage girl who is uh, serving drinks at this party. And I'll read this paragraph. This is right at the top of page five. Uh, Greta moved on. She kept smiling. Nobody looked at her with any recognition of pleasure, and why should they? People's eyes uh, slid, slid round her, and they went on with their conversations. They laughed. Everybody but Greta was equipped with friends, so she is very isolated at this party. Jokes, half-secrets, everybody appeared to have found someone to welcome them, except for the teenagers who kept sullenly, relentlessly passing their pink drinks. And, you know, even that color pink is very much likened to women, uh, especially when you talk about uh, these defined gender roles, right? I mean, even like Victoria's Secret isn't one of their line of clothing pink. And if you're being critical of these notions, you could say on one hand, yes, it's nurturing uh, kind of a, a, a female identity, and that's a good thing. But on the other hand, it is categorizing and defining uh, a female identity and the color pink. Uh, and maybe that's more uh, disadvantageous than helpful, right? So you can, be, you can look at it in two different ways here. The life of a domestic housewife, this is my note here. When I think about she feels connected to these teenagers who are just doing a job and serving these pink drinks. The life of a domestic housewife is likened to the life of a teenager with a measly job to do, always essentially in the background, serving and providing. Now this is interesting because it makes me think of something else later on in the text. Serving and providing. That's my role, to serve and provide. Not to take, but to always give, 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 right? And that's what these teenagers at this party are doing. They are giving and giving and giving and giving. There's a wonderful uh, passage later on in the text when Greta and Katie are on the train headed to Toronto. Uh, as we know, they're going to kind of house sit, right? And it's kind of a getaway for them. Uh, Peter is work conferences, practical, pragmatic as always. And 
then they come into contact with those two 20-somethings. And the one is Greg, right? And it, it's, this is where we actually get into some religious illusions, uh, which the story doesn't give us too much of that, but a, a little bit here and there. Greg is likened to Christ. He's likened to Jesus Christ in the scene where he is just making the children laugh and, and keeping them entertained and kind of, uh, I guess you could say, interacting with them uh, consistently and, and continuously. And it says there that he was the kind of guy who could just give and give and give and give all of himself nonstop and not have to like take a break or not have to kind of relent from all that giving and kind of uh, recluse himself uh, and, 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 you know, take or, you know, or, or find this kind of period of rest. He is likened to this guy who just gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. And I think that's one of the big themes of this story is the idea of taking, 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 or giving, giving, giving. Are we trying to strike a balance? Uh, should we just be the giver 110% or should we be the taker 110%? But here, the teenagers give and give and give. They never stop giving. Greg later will be likened to that, uh, will, be, will be given a similar type of description when he is interacting and engaging with those children, uh, which is pretty uh, pretty pretty amazing really now of course we also know that she'll have an affair with this guy uh, and and they will have sex on that train so there is that to contend with as well all right I'll just read a few of my notes here this is all coming from page five so essentially Greta is a grown woman uh, who longs uh, for a greater purpose of life beyond a housewife uh, she tries to engage a young girl now that's interesting this is a young woman it's almost like, on a figurative level, Greta wants to explain all of the difficulties of her life, the restrictions of her life, right? So she wants to and explain it to a young woman who might be going through very similar dilemmas uh, as she uh, advances in age. Uh, and so she wants to engage this young woman about her difficult journey. Literally, the difficult journey getting to this party. Figuratively, the difficult journey getting to this point right uh, especially as a housewife but this teenage girl is unfortunately unreceptive which again maybe is a bit of a letdown for Greta I want to express all of my troubles I want to express the 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 tough times I've had pushing through this existence and here's a a wonderful young woman that I can explain this to it's so ideal it's so perfect it's almost like she has an audience for her poetry uh, in that young girl and the girl could care not that she could care less but she's just too busy. Uh, this is going to be the end of part two. Uh, obviously, uh, this kind of trails on. This probably will be over an hour, this lecture altogether. It might speed up at some point. That's my bell here, so I'm going to stop for uh, the moment. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, so just to give you some information on the film that's uh, uh, referenced here, uh, 400 Blows, it's a French New Wave film. Uh, the protagonist of the film is a teenager, uh, and he has a very kind of rebellious uh, attitude uh, and behavior. Uh, the film itself uh, expresses criticisms of the injustices and treatment of juvenile offenders in France during the 1950s uh, through the 1960s. And lastly, the protagonist's father is not his real father, but I, I think there's kind of a, uh, it, it becomes uh, more or less a, a father figure. Uh, for uh, the young man. I don't think these uh, themes of the film uh, dramatically uh, or, or perfectly f uh, plug into uh, what's happening uh, in this story. Uh, the way it's used is you have uh, Greta who's seen this film and is using this as a way to break into uh, the discussions that are taking place at this literary party. So she feels when I've seen the film, uh, I too can partake uh, in the talk uh, about the film. Uh, but of course she's kind of rejected as well. Uh, I had mentioned before that um, one of the most disillusioning things about this party that she attends is that it's happening in a suburban neighborhood. It's being held in a home uh, in a suburban neighborhood, which uh, is an indication that the gender roles, um, the steadfast gender roles, uh, uh, especially as women is kind of a support system for men, but nothing more, um, definitely apply. I'll just read a little bit here, which kind of furthers uh, this idea. Uh, on these grounds, uh, Greta thought it might be possible to go up and introduce herself and the woman might see her as somebody worthy of being talked to in spite of the coolness at the door. 
But, she saw then, the woman had her head lolling around on the shoulder of the man who had called out to her, and they probably would not welcome an interruption. Before that, she thought, such a woman might have been isolated as she herself was, not being a wife or a man poet. But she didn't go around weaseling and smiling, as, as Greta did. Uh, she uh, was braver. Um, so, rather, we have a woman poet here. Uh, who doesn't seem uh, to care or put on a face. Uh, and of course, Greta herself desires to be acknowledged by this woman writer. Uh, just to uh, return one more time, uh, just to kind of situate ourselves in, in potentially one of the biggest themes of this text, you have Greta, who is a housewife. She has published a couple poems in this literary magazine, and therefore she's trying to participate in this world uh, of uh, literature, right, and literary uh, acclaim. It's her way of breaking free from this kind of the, the, the role as a domestic housewife. And on one hand, we, we should be congratulating her, right? That's what we talked about with the feminism, right? People are being very critical of feminism during the time period of the 1950s, 1960s, because the idea is, well, yeah, you can have ambition as a woman, um, but some people are seeing it as a crime because it's taking you away from more traditional responsibilities. And that's kind of the struggle here. How virtuous is Greta's pursuit of this poetic lifestyle and being involved in this poetic world, even though it is very clear it is taking her away from her husband and it is taking her, her away from her child as well, which a lot of this, uh, a lot of the story as we move forward explores. Okay, moving on to uh, the next page here, page six. I'm going to uh, read a little bit here. I guess uh, just before I, I read the paragraph at the top of the page, it's important to note that when you're a poet, and I think Greta is kind of faced with this, you need an audience. Uh, we talked about that girl uh, who was handing out drinks, uh, uh, relentlessly handing out drinks, uh, never-endingly uh, handing out drinks at the party, and of course Greta wants to talk to her, especially as an older woman who's been through so much trial tribula and, tri and tribulation, uh, and to kind of, I guess you could say, tutor or at least share her experiences with that, that young teenage girl as she is on the verge of adulthood herself. But of course the girl's not interested, so she's not getting that audience uh, that she is uh, hoping for. Um, it says it right at the top of page six, she thought of something interesting to explain to somebody, but there was no one, there was nobody around to hear it. You know, you're, she can't, ex she tries to, you know, have these kinds of discussions with her husband, but her husband really doesn't really entertain such discussions. So I guess she's at a lack of an audience here as well. You would also, uh, you could also imagine that she's at a lack of an audience for the way she feels about her marriage. If, you're, if your marriage is less than fulfilling, if your marriage is unsatisfactory, then really the hardest person to talk about those things with is your husband or is the, the person who's on the, you know, who's a part of that relationship. So sometimes that's, that can be what poetry is. It's a way of kind of venting and getting out some emotions that otherwise you really can't share with in, a, a more intimate uh, people around you or people who are closer to you. But you're always uh, uh, in the need for an audience of some kind to hear uh, your issues and your conflicts. I'll read this. Uh, she says, the narration says, it was this. When she went to an engineer's cocktail party with Peter, the atmosphere was relatively pleasant, striving to be pleasant, though she found the talk boring. So at the cocktail party, people were very kind, very considerate, and everything is very pleasant. However, she finds the discussions incredibly boring. Moving on. Here, the talk might not be boring if you could get into it, but the atmosphere was rather frightening. So we have a clear contrast between two types of parties, the engineer party versus this kind of uh, literature uh, party, if you will, this writer's party. And while it's pleasant yet boring at the engineer's party, if you could get into these conversations, they would be incredibly stimulating uh, and intriguing. But the problem is, is everybody kind of keeps you out. Uh, there's, there's definite kind of barriers and boundaries and it's a very frightening experience for her. Moving on, and why? At Peter's business party, everybody's importance was fixed and settled. That's an interesting idea when you think about the occupation that Peter is involved with. You go to these parties, oh, that's the boss, 
Uh, these are the underlings right here. And everybody's kind of position is fixed and settled uh, within this type of, uh, I guess you could say, uh, corporate uh, or, or, or business or at least pragmatic atmosphere. Um, however, when you are at these literary uh, uh, parties, the whole idea is people are trying to rise up with their level of workmanship, rise up with their level of uh, kind of skill or acclaim. And so there's always this kind of competition uh, that's in order, uh, maybe even more so than other environments uh, that we could imagine. This gets back to the idea that good is never good enough, and that seems to tear uh, at Greta, that good is never good enough. Good is never good enough as far as poetry goes because it can always be better uh, and you can always kind of make a name for yourself more and more. And also importantly, good is never good enough in terms of the relationship that she is in. Um, even though the text doesn't give us that much information, um, we do understand that we do understand that she is sexually unsettled, right? That she goes outside extra um, uh, she goes outside of her marriage. Uh, in order to find some kind of sexual desire, right, some sexual fulfillment. The story, however, doesn't really talk about the unfulfillment uh, as far as Peter goes, right, as far as sex and, and sexuality goes. But I, I guess we can learn through the contrast she's going out for it, so there must be something lacking at home. Um, so again, good is good enough at these engineer parties, not so at the poetry, uh, at the writer's uh, party. Now, because good is good enough and things are fixed and settled, that's the reason why people are allowed to be pleasant. Uh, and that's one of the points that's made in this paragraph here. Okay, very good. So a, a clear contrast uh, as far as the type of people and the types of atmospheres and environments of these two parties. Okay. We're always asking ourselves when you think about the contrast of these parties, does this apply to their marriage? Right. Does this apply to her marriage? A couple uh, paragraphs down. When she got, uh, I'll, I'll read. When she got her theory of the unpleasantness worked out, she felt relieved and didn't much care uh, if anybody talked to her or not. She took off her shoes and the relief was immense. There's the heels. We uh, talked about the literal burden as well as the figurative burden of the heels. You know, the literal burden of the heels is they're just hard to walk in, especially if you've got to traverse some difficult terrain or walk quite a distance. Heels can be difficult. On a figurative level, heels can be difficult because you're forcing yourself into this, this ideal um, uh, uh, sense of what a woman is, uh, especially perhaps an independent woman who is vying for uh, some kind of place in the world, right? And that's potentially why you're wearing these heels in the first place. Um, so it's the figurative burden of these heels. And in this paragraph on page six, she takes these heels off and the relief is immense, both literally and even more importantly, as always, uh, figuratively. Okay, very good. This is where we are introduced to uh, Harris Bennett. And believe it or not, he, he's at this party, but he's not a, a writer in the literary sense. He's a journalist. Um, journalism is, is much more pragmatic for the, for the most part. I mean, you can have quite the conversation about current day, the current day uh, situation with journalism and fake news and who's really producing the fake news and is there any real authentic news out there and, and, and where do you find it? So it's, it's a conversation in itself, but he's a journalist. And when you compare it to uh, poetry, when you compare it to prose writing, uh, journalism is supposed to be much more practical and pragmatic. There's a real purpose for it. We are reporting, right? Um, also, when you talk about journalism, at least the way it should be, it should be very objective, um, unless it's an editorial where you're you know, giving an opinion or, or really kind of pushing a perspective of some kind. Uh, journalism should always be objective, so we can see some clear contrast between journalism and, uh, let's say, uh, literary writing. Okay. Now this man, and I'm fairly certain it turns out to be Harris, um, this man uh, wrote a play about the Dachabors, um, which is referenced right at the bottom of page uh, six. This is where, this is I think for the first time where some religious illusions start to uh, factor into the story. To give you an idea of who the Dachobors are, I had to look this up, which is great because you learn uh, just by reading a simple story, you learn about a lot of different things. 
the docavores were they they're a, I think they're still going here. They're a, a kind of a very fringe sect of Christianity <clears throat> that comes out of Russia, and these are the spirit warriors of Christ. Uh, they emigrate to Canada around 1900. Spirit warriors of Christ. They are die-hard pacifists, <clears throat> which means they don't believe in war. Uh, they don't believe in uh, really. Uh, uh, combat, and I would imagine they don't believe in competition, knowing that war and combat uh, is kind of the uh, the epitome uh, of uh, competition. So they don't believe in these things; they they, they reject them. Um, so they're pacifists. They live in communes. They reject personal materialism. So I guess you could call them minimalists, right? Um, and they have little use for schools. Uh, they don't really need public education. Uh, again, I guess you could say when you think about public education, I got kids testing next door right now. It's all competition, right? Everybody's competing against each other. The DACA boards don't feel the need to engage in that competition. Uh, I think the idea is they're trying to get back to the actual teachings of Christ and break away from the teachings of the institution of the church. Um, and as my mom reminded me uh, the other day when we were talking about some issues that connected to certain things that I'm reading, uh, there's, a, there's a phrase out there that says Christ would have been a horrible high school student because he wouldn't have cared about the, com the competitive nature of it, uh, which is an interesting idea. So this is the Dockabors that are mentioned. He had done a play on them. Uh, all right, and they have a low regard for advanced education. Now, how does this connect in any kind of way to what we've talked about so far? I think if we go back to that kind of mantra uh, of uh, Greta, which is good is not good enough, and for Peter, good is good enough, right? Settle and fixed. Um, if you have no need for competition, if there's no real competitive drive or yearning or insatiable uh, attitude that you have, uh, then good is good enough. So I think the docabors represent the, the side of Peter in a sense. Also, this links up. What do we know about Peter? He comes from Eastern Europe. Uh, he comes from, uh, you know, uh, I guess it could be Russia or at least some of those satellite countries uh, in that area. And the docabors originate out of uh, Russia as well. So I think we're finding some linkage right there. All right, very good. So one thing that uh, Harris Bennett does uh, reveal is that it is his son and daughter, grandchildren of the hosts. And they were the ones who were passing out some of the drinks. So this man does have a connection to um, those two youngsters, uh, those two teenagers who were handing out drinks. Not sure exactly what to make of it, but there is a connection there. Okay, so I'll read this paragraph here in the middle of, uh, the middle of uh, page seven, right in the middle. She hoped he wouldn't ask what she was doing at the party. I, I guess at this point, she's a bit embarrassed. Moving on. If she had to say she was a poet, her present situation, her overindulgence would seem so drearily typical. She even calls it overindulgence at that point. You know, going out of her way to attend this party uh, and kind of this, this vast distance, both literal and figurative. Uh, she even does refer to it as overindulgence at this point. Back into the text. It wasn't dark out, but it was evening. They seemed to be headed in the right direction, along some water, then over a bridge. Here it is. It'll happen later uh, when we're in the train cars and that little space in between, that, you know, bumpy, noisy little part in between, which we've probably all uh, kind of, you know, uh, been across at some point in our lives. But here's the first bridge, uh, and it is the bridge that she's about to go over uh, with Harris Bennett. Back into the text. The text, the Bird Street Bridge, then more traffic. She kept opening her eyes to the trees passing by, then shutting her eyes again without meaning to. When the car stopped, she knew it was too soon for them to be home, that is, at her home. And then he says to her shortly after, just sit and consider. So there is this idea that he, he wants to have something happen in this moment, uh, and of course he's leaving it up to her to consider. Uh, and we are on the verge of adultery, uh, as far as Greta's situation does go here. I'll read a little bit more here at the bottom of seven. He said that he had already told her that, possibly twice. But once again, okay, Harris Bennett, Bennett. He was the son-in-law of the people who had given the party. Those were his children, passing out the drinks. He and they were visiting from Toronto. Was she satisfied? Um, 
Harry, Harris is a kind of a derivative of Harry, and it means home or house ruler, which, you know, superficially seems quite authorita uh, authoritative, right? So maybe this is kind of an authoritative male figure in, in, her, in her life. Maybe this is what she has been fantasizing about, uh, fant uh, um, fantasizing about. Uh, maybe this is what she is in need for. Uh, Bennett means blessed, uh, given blessings as home or house ruler. So I'm not sure if blessed uh, really kind of factors into this as well. Now this is the same Harris Bennett who will show up at the very end of the text. And the question that you can ask yourself is, does she even want him to be there? Um, I think at that point she's kind of forgotten about him or at least she's kind of changed directions in her mind and then there he is and he shows up. Right. Um, okay. So this could be a little bit difficult to analyze, uh, I would say, but we find out a little bit about Harris's wife uh, and the mother of his children, uh, and she's in a mental uh, asylum. Uh, she's essentially kind of gone mad, and we don't find out why she's gone mad. We can only speculate, uh, but maybe it has something to do with her husband, right? Um, I guess another question you could ask yourself to be quite critical is, is Greta on the verge of madness? Um, would she go mad if she wasn't given these opportunities to pursue some kind of poetic career and it was just that housewife status uh, that she uh, had to live uh, permanently and that was it? We, I don't know exactly what to make of this, but I can say that madness now is a theme that we can at least explore and see how it connects to Greta, uh, our protagonist here, okay? Now, this is interesting. Uh, this is just a little bit in on page eight. Uh, I'll read, on the Lionsgate Bridge, now this is, we're on that bridge. A lot can be said of a bridge. A bridge is, um, first of all, it's kind of a, 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 you could say it's a relationship of some kind. I think primarily it represents the relationship or the marriage between Peter and Greta. But it's also in general this place where good is not good enough. And when it's not good enough, we, uh, add, we kind of, I guess, respond to the shakiness and the noisiness of it. Uh, and we feel this need to, um, be restless uh, and maybe even kind of, you know, scream a, a little bit. So the bridge is an interesting place. When good is not good enough, shaky, bumpy, noisy, it's not good enough, do you kind of just deal with it and cope with it? Or do you um, lash out? Uh, do you kind of rail uh, against uh, that idea that good is not good enough, right? You just kind of let it drive you crazy. So on the Lionsgate Bridge, he said, excuse me for sounding how I did. I was thinking whether I would or wouldn't kiss you, and I decided I wouldn't. Then it goes on to say, she thought he was saying that there was something about her that didn't quite measure up to being kissed. The mortification was like being slapped clean back into sobriety. So she's kind of been going along in this alluring way uh, over this bridge, waiting for this kind of moment where she would indulge in this, right? And indulgence is the word to use here. She would indulge in this extramarital affair um, and, 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 and share some intimate moments uh, with this man, Harris. And he says, I've decided I wouldn't want to kiss you. And it's kind of like a deflation, right? Uh, and it, it kind of takes, the, it takes everything out of that moment. It's almost like maybe he's dealing with something that she, in a very similar way to what she's dealing with too. He was searching for the same thing, but in that moment of kind of crises, in that moment of escalation where you can kind of capitulate on the kiss and you can make it happen, he, and you're on that bridge, right? It's shaky, good is not good enough, good is not good enough. My wife's in a mental home. I should go outside of this marriage and find something more appealing or something that's gonna make me feel better. And good is not good enough, but what does he do? He copes with it, right? And he decides not to kiss her. And it kind of puts her in her place uh, at the same time. Okay, what we find out, because we have a major section break uh, mid, uh, on the middle of page eight, so time passes, etc. But what we do find out is that this guy is occupying her thoughts. Harris Bennett is occupying her thoughts night and day. And you might be asking yourself, why? Why would this, and that's one of the questions I have here, why would this man occupy her thoughts? And of course, you'd want to get down a very clear and detailed response. Um, after this experience with Harris Bennett, or this 
non-experience, I guess you could call it in some respects, because it doesn't really happen the way she intended it to, or, or maybe imagined or fantasized that it would. Her poetry takes a beating as well. Uh, she has difficulty writing it. It says, and what about her poetry? She wrote not a line, not a word. The view wasn't there. There is no poetic view. Uh, it, she seems to be creatively stifled uh, in that sense, right? Um, and she seems to kind of be ruminating over this, uh, this experience with Harris. At the bottom of uh, page eight, it reads, then a jolt came, the prospect, then certainty of the job at Lund, the offer of the house in Toronto, a clear break in the weather, an access of boldness. Uh, so we do know that her husband's going to have to go on a work trip and she's going to be able to house sit in Toronto and take Kay uh, Katie with her. So she sees this as a break in the weather and an act of boldness. She's going to be bold uh, and kind of take advantage of this opportunity. There is a correlation as I, you know, to say one more thing about the her thoughts of Harris and the fact that she's having difficult writing uh, poetry, there is a correlation. There's a correlation between the denied kiss from the stranger and the uh, fact that she is having this difficulty in writing uh, this poetry. But she also has an urge to write the poetry too. Just because she's not writing it doesn't mean she, has the, she, she doesn't have the urge to do so. Uh, she's denied that kiss from Harris. She is denied recognition and presence as a poet. Uh, with poetry, there is always a stranger on the other end that we are hoping to be kissed by. I think that's a nice way of putting it, and that's my own words. And I'll just repeat that. With poetry, there is always a stranger on the other end that we are hoping to be kissed by, or embraced, or accepted, or loved, uh, or envied in some kind of way. And that's the indulgence of poetry. Um, I think there are some people out there, uh, poets, that write for themselves. Uh, you know, it's kind of a school of thought. I write for myself, but there's others uh, that obviously write to be uh, adored. Uh, and if you can nail both of those, uh, then I think you're doing a pretty good job as a poet if you can uh, skirt both of those uh, intentions. So we get the uh, title on page nine. We do get the title, It Will Reach Japan. Um, this is the letter that she writes off to Harris, uh, kind of I wouldn't say frivolously, friv friv uh, but she does just kind of, uh, it, it's almost like that urge to write is this, this urge, it, it materializes in this urge to write this kind of cutesy letter uh, and sentimental letter and send it off to Harris. And the letter reads, writing this letter is like putting a note in a bottle and hoping it will reach Japan. And there's the title of the text, it will reach, uh, to reach Japan. And I think if you're looking for some meaning on the title, uh, this is taking place in Canada. And what is half a world away? Uh, what is uh, perhaps one of the most exotic uh, kind of uh, you know, locations or regions that we can sentimentalize about? Uh, and that would be <clears throat> Japan. So it is the unknown. To reach Japan is to reach the unknown. It's to reach the outer limits uh, of our desire and our imagination. And I think that's what the title is all about. And that's what this relationship with Harris represents, uh, is to somehow reach the outer limits of her imagination, what a relationship can be, uh, how we can factor in uh, this kind of poetic expression and have that be a part of a relationship. Because it has no place with Peter, Mr. Practical, the stone in the rock of her life. Right? It just doesn't seem to have any application to uh, him. All right. And it even mentions right after that, this was the nearest thing to a poem that she had written in some time. And that's interesting. The first thing that she kind of declares or recognizes as poetry is a letter that is sent out to Harris because it represents all of this together, represents her poetic indulgence uh, and the indulgence that she has uh, that lies outside of her marriage. Poetry has a big part of it, has a big, very big part of it. Okay, moving on. So we get another section break at the end of, uh, toward the end of page nine. And the first thing we, we get in the, the next section is Katie, uh, it says, Kev Katie had evidently not understood that Peter's being outside on the platform meant that he would not be traveling with them. Katie is young. Um, I, I don't know if we get an exact age, but I think it's probably like five, six, something uh, along that, five, six years old. So there's not a, 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 a clear cognizance uh, of, you know, why is daddy out there and why is he not in here? So, the, you know, that's how, you know, kids can't necessarily put it all together. 
But at the same time, we can look at this figuratively. So Katie has this feeling that Peter would, her father would always be traveling with them on this train. She didn't know that because he's on the outside of the train and he's on the platform, that means he's not coming along. So on a figurative sense, we do have this idea that Katie is always there. Or I'm sorry, that Peter is always there. He is almost like a spirit. And what is it? He is the spirit of that rock and that spirit of that steadiness and that spirit of that practicality and that spirit of the mantra, good is good enough deal with it, cope with it, right? Be patient with it. And that spirit and all of those ideas that he represents are traveling with them uh, on this train. And probably for good reason, right? Okay. Another section break on page 10, top of page 10. Uh, they're you know, trying to find a play area on the train. Obviously, if you're taking a long train ride, uh, there's all kinds of, you know, sections of the train where you can kind of spread your legs a little bit. And uh, uh, there's a playroom uh, for the children as well. And I like this little detail. And you can, this is what craft is all about, you know, writer's craft. Uh, we're essentially given a kind of metaphorical way of understanding the conflicts uh, of the characters. And this happens in the first paragraph. I'll read it and then I'll explain. It starts with, there was a play area for children, but it was quite small. A boy and a girl, a brother and sister, by the looks of their matching bunny rabbit outfits, had taken it over. Their game consisted of running small vehicles at each other, then deflecting them at the last moment. Crash, bang, crash. So this kind of game they're playing with these trucks, with these vehicles, uh, where they're running them at them at full speed and then they're kind of deflecting. Uh, at the last moment uh, and there's this kind of accident and there's this kind of crash isn't that the way that Greta has been conducting uh, her uh, life outside of her relationship uh, with uh, her husband right everything is kind of a full uh, because she has this need to indulge it's kind of everything is running at it at, she's running at this idea of being accepted into this world of poetry. She's running at this idea of an extramarital affair, and she's going at these things in such a full speed, and then it's leading to uh, kind of a deflection, I guess you could say, but definitely the crash, bang, crash, uh, quite, it's leading to quite a bit of chaos uh, as well. So I think you can, you can relate that to uh, what she's dealing with here. Uh, then we go into some allusions to uh, Winnie the Pooh uh, and Christopher Robin. And if you look up a little bit of information on Christopher Robin, uh, this is the author A.A. A. Milne, and he's the only person I know that I actually share my birth date with. So I'll let you look that up and you'll know my birthday. A.A. A. Milne is the author of Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin. And Christopher Robin is essentially a coming of age and a, a, a kind of a, a growing up uh, tale uh, for this young boy. Um, one thing that's kind of unfortunate in the world of uh, Winnie the Pooh is when he comes home from boarding school, because he's always, he's going off to boarding school, which is uh, kind of a, a dose of realism and a dose of, you know, a, the adult world and the, you know, ma the mature world, um, obligations, rules, all the things we don't like to think about as a kid, but we know are on the horizon. And Christopher Robin is not, uh, you know, immune to these things. He too uh, has to uh, kind of grow up. Right, So he's always coming back and getting in touch with Winnie the Pooh and Piglet uh, and uh, Tigger and all these wonderful characters that maybe some of you, um, you know, know quite a bit about. But we take this idea of coming of age and having to grow up and mature. And I think who, we, who does this reflect most? Maybe Katie. Uh, Katie, believe it or not, and I was having this discussion with my mom because she read the story, which was pretty cool. So I was talking about with her. We gotta remember that Katie, especially by the end of this text, uh, expresses a maturity that Greta could only wish for. Uh, she is incredibly mature, and she seems to have a very kind of rationalistic way of looking at the world, which does away with indulgence. So who is the coming of age story probably most needed for? It's probably Greta. As children, we are supposed to overindulge. That's what Christopher Robin uh, is doing in these stories. He's overindulging you probably in his imagination. And that's why this kind of wonderful, vivid, uh, colorful, uh, kind and caring world starts to take place where anything is possible, right? The world of Winnie the Pooh. But eventually you have to leave that world of overindulgence and imagination behind and you have to come into the adult world. And I think that's what Greta needs. Um, I think she needs to kind of grow up, so to speak, 
and mature to the point where she recognizes that there's more at stake than the need for her overindulgence uh, that is directed toward the world of poetry, that is directed toward these extramarital affairs. Right? So she needs a coming of age here. Um, and I, I would imagine this is all preceding Greg, uh, and Greg has a lot to do with her recognizing what she needs to do uh, in order to change. Okay, very good. Not too sure what to make of this at the bottom of page 10, but there's some discussion about Katie doesn't really like Greg uh, upon first meeting. Uh, she seems to have a, a guard up uh, against this person. Um, I'll just read a little bit. This is at the very bottom of 10. Greta laughed, but Katie didn't. She was a bit scandalized. She understood words coming out of a book, but not coming out of somebody's mouth without a book. Um, so the whole experience with Greg, and, and Greg is quite charismatic, uh, he's very entertaining, but Katie seems to have a guard up at first. And I think Katie is, I would say, while Greta is incredibly failable and we're, we're, we're very cautious uh, when we uh, start to analyze her uh, intentions and her attitudes and her feelings about herself and her marriage and the world itself, um, I think Katie, on the other hand, is infallible. Knowing that her name represents purity and cleansliness, this is kind of what we're trying to get back to, right? This is the, uh, this is the kind of perspective on life that we're all trying to have here. So I really do feel like Katie can do no wrong in this text, and we can learn a lot about how Greta needs to change by looking at the uh, steady uh, characterization uh, of Katie here. All right, moving on to page 11. Just to give you, uh, this is Greg and Lori. Now this is interesting. They're actually a kind of college-aged couple and they used to be a couple, uh, but they are not, not a couple any longer, but they have remained friends. Uh, so we have kind of more insight into versions of relationships uh, in this story. Of course, the, the, the primary relationship I guess you were most concerned with is Peter uh, and Greta, but here now we have another relationship to consider. It didn't work out, uh, but they are uh, incredibly friendly and on good terms with one another, Lori and Greg. Greg translates to watchful and alert. Now watchful and alert is interesting because we do have a reference to the guards of Buckingham Palace. Uh, as you know, you've probably seen pictures or maybe you've been to uh, London and you've walked by the palace. These guys are always on alert. So the name Greg, which means watchful and alert, has a direct correlation to uh, those guards. All right? And even in this page, on uh, page 11, uh, it, it mentions a couple things about guards. So again, we can... It's hard for me, I would have to spend hours upon hours even further annotating uh, the text that I have here. And I've already done uh, quite, a, quite a job. Sometimes I can just point things out. There's another theme here, this idea of guardliness, uh, of being on guard. Just a moment ago, Katie was on guard uh, when first encountering Greg. So maybe there's this idea of, of, of having to be on guard, or maybe it's the idea of having to let your guard down uh, a little bit, one of the two. Uh, but it's a, it's a theme now that's being presented by the author. I'll read a little bit on the middle of page 11. It says, quote, they were both quite beautiful. This is Greg and Lori. They were both quite beautiful. Oh, really quickly, Lori translates as the original capital of the Latins. So when we talk about, you know, Italy, we talk about that region, uh, not Latin America as in South America, but, you know, where the Latin language originates, which is in that kind of Italian peninsula, that area. Um, Lori translates to Laurentum, uh, and the, it's the original capital of the Latins. And I guess, so if we're talking about romance and idealism, uh, maybe, maybe that's the idea. Okay, back to what I was about to read. They were both quite beautiful, Greta thought. Tall, limber, almost unnaturally lean, he with crinkly dark hair, she black-haired and sleek as a Madonna. Uh, Madonna is uh, another name for the Virgin Mary, uh, either alone or with the child Jesus. Now, this is more religious kind of illusions that are taking place here. So, Lori is reference to uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, either with, and if you look at paintings uh, or depictions of the Virgin Mary, sometimes she appears with baby uh, Jesus, uh, sometimes she is completely by herself, and it's just kind of uh, just her, you know, just uh, 
her as an individual. But here's the idea. If she's likened to Madonna, she's likened to the Virgin Mary, then who would be Jesus? It would be Greg, her companion, right? Doing away with the literal ideas that they're kind of lovers or, or, or previous lovers and all of this, on a figurative, symbolic level, we could say that Greg is Jesus. Now, this does make sense because we get some kind of validation uh, of Greg being a very Christ-like figure. Uh, endlessly giving. Uh, he gives so much and he possesses this inhuman capability uh, of never having to kind of retreat to himself and kind of deal, you know, just focus on himself. He can just keep giving and giving and giving and giving. And this is something that Greta recognizes. And I think this is what probably leads to some major character uh, changes uh, or characterization changes uh, for her. Okay. Not sure exactly what to make of this. Um, they, they, they basically just reveal that they were together for three years and they've, they've decided to uh, split up. It says nothing to be scandalized about. They were breaking up after three years together. They had been chased for months, at least with each other, which means they have not been having sex with one another. But it kind of infers that they are going outside of the, this, this relationship and, and finding uh, some kind of sexual uh, uh, activity, right? And then right after it says, now no more Buckingham Palace, said Greg to Katie, meaning no more Buckingham Palace, no more guards, no more guarding ourselves. So I'm not sure exactly what to make of it. Um, you know, I guess in a kind of almost 180 degrees, while I kind of see the end of this text being Greta has found the resolve she needs to be the mother and devoted to her family and be, uh, you know, that rock that her family can rely on, much like Peter has been that rock that her family can, that the family can rely on. Maybe the other idea is that, at least if you, you can interpret it this way, that she's learning that you can end the relationship as well, uh, and that you don't have to be so guarded about it uh, all the time, that maybe you, you can end the relationship. Not sure, you just got to look for evidence going in either direction here as we move forward. Might, it might be, it could be, though I'm a little weary of this overall interpretation, but it could be that a, an indication to Greta uh, that such a thing is possible and positive. Okay, next page. And I got a lot of notes here, as you can see. Uh, so we'll try to get this through this, not too, too much time. Okay. I think it's probably just better if I read through a lot of the notes that I have here. So one thing we learn on this page through Greg's interaction with these children, Greg is giving entirely here to Katie. He is not holding back in the least. It's all giving. I guess Greta wishes she could be like him, but the poetry she has had to keep to herself felt correctly so that it could not exist with her role as a domestic housewife. How can this world of indulging in poetry also kind of, you know, be blended with her role as a mother. She's always had to keep these incredibly separate, and maybe that's gotten in the way of her being able to give entirely uh, to uh, her daughter. Uh, it mentioned earlier in the text, this is just kind of, you know, basic recall. Uh, where did the indulgence and the thinking about poetry really kind of uh, have its moment, or when did she have time for it? When her daughter was napping, which means that when her daughter is awake, she's, you know, she's kind of giving to her daughter in the way she needs to, but one of the criticisms we'll have by the end of this text is she wants to give 110% uh, always, not holding back here or, or you know, restricting herself here, but always giving. Uh, he's quite the actor which is mentioned uh, a couple times here uh, as he's entertaining it, uh, all of these uh, children, uh, most notably Katie. Why don't we just read a little bit and maybe some ideas, more ideas will pop into uh, my mind here. So, moving on. Lori and Greta followed them. Greta was hoping he wasn't one of those adults who make friends with children mostly to test their own charms, then grow bored and grumpy when they realize how tireless a child's affections can be. 
what I just read there is synonymous to Greta and Harris, especially the tireless affections. Was Harris just seeing how far he could get Greta to go to the verge of that kiss and then he was like, my charms work, don't need it? Um, there's something similar here. Uh, moving on, by lunchtime, she knew she didn't need to worry. What had happened wasn't that Katie's attentions were wearing Greg out, but that various other children had joined the competition and he was giving no sign of being worn at all. She likens it, we've talked about a competition going back you know, several minutes ago, earlier in the lecture, we talked about a competition. All these kids were competing for Greg's attentions. Uh, so it is a competition. Next paragraph. No, that was wrong. He didn't set up a competition. So Greg is so, I guess you could say, careful uh, about the work that he does here as he's engaging with these children. He makes sure not to make it a competition. And that, that's an interesting idea, right? Um, it goes back to the DACA boards, uh, that we talked about earlier who don't feel the need to engage with competition. And these are people who follow the direct messages of Christ and here Greg is very much embodying that idea of Christ that you don't make things a competition, right? That's where we all seem to fall apart. Uh, he managed things so that he turned the attention first drawn to himself into an awareness of each other. He brings the attention to himself and then that becomes an awareness of, of everybody around him. Give me your attention and then I will make sure to direct your attention to an awareness of everybody that you are here with. It's a fascinating um, idea, especially when you think about what a teacher does in a classroom, right? It's not about me. It's about give me your attention for, for a moment and let me help to diffuse that awareness uh, to everybody around you and so that you feel connected. And this, this is not a competition to say the least. Uh, and then into games that were lively or even wild, but not bad-tempered. Tantrums didn't occur. Spoils vanished. That's what Greta has been dealing with internally. Tantrums. Right? She is having tantrums about her life. Um, she is you know, maybe trying to find more spoils in her life, right? like the spoils of war or the spoils of conquest. Maybe that's what she's been after. Back into the text. There simply wasn't time with so much more interesting play going on. It was a miracle. Now that word right there is deliberately placed by the author, knowing we're talking about some allusions to Christ and this kind of overall characterization of Christ as embodied by Greg. Let's throw in that word miracle. It was a miracle how much ease with wildness was managed in such a small place and the energy expended promised naps in the afternoon. I could go on and on on this page. I have zillion notes, but there's that idea of wild. Wild is an inability to restrain yourself. Wild is uncivilized. Uh, wild is the need to um, become a part of some competition that leads to tumultuous feelings inside, right? And here he's able to kind of eradicate that wildness or at least manage it. He manages that wildness in a very small space. And the energy expended promised naps in the afternoon, which of course is rest, uh, which is an important religious concept as well, uh, being day seven, right? Sunday, a day of rest. Seven is also the day of rest after day six, which is uh, the creation of man, which by default is the imperfections of man. And one of the imperfections of man quite commonly is uh, this inability to control ourselves uh, in, in face of a competitive drive and greed and lust and overindulgence and gluttony and all of these things. Uh, so you can look at this quite religiously. Okay, I'll read this paragraph because it seems quite important. And then uh, this is right in the middle of 12. In the decade that they had already entered but that she had not taken much notice of, there was going to be a lot of attention paid to that sort of thing. Being there was to mean something it didn't used to mean. So coming out for a second, what it's saying is, in the next 10 years of her life, she was gonna realize that being there means something new that she didn't understand beforehand, being there. That could be a question that I ask you. What does it mean to be there for somebody? Is it just, here's your food, here's the roof over your head, here's your tablet, here's your cell phone, I'll pay that cell phone bill for you, I'm here for you. Or is it psychological and mental and emotional and spiritual? What does it mean to be there for your child? Or really anybody in your life that you uh, that's that's very close to you. 
So I'll, re I'll get back into the text here. Being there was to mean something it didn't used to mean. Going with the flow. Giving. People were giving. Other people were not very giving. Barriers between the inside and outside of yourself were to be trampled down. Authenticity required it. So there's that idea of letting that guard down. Barriers between the inside and outside of yourself were to be trampled down. So now I think I understand the meaning of breaking down these walls. Greta needs to let these walls down. And the wall that she needs to let down is to get over this idea that you are only a domestic housewife. If we wholeheartedly indulge in that idea of feminism, which is follow your motivations, and I'm not discounting it, right? This story is being critical of the idea of feminism. So one more time, if I could get back to this. Um, if I completely indulge in the idea of what feminism means to me, to, get, to break through, to break boundaries, um, there's also a wall that's being kind of set up for myself. And that wall is, I will not be content with my role as a housewife. You put up a wall. There's no way I'm going to be content with my role as just a mother. And so we put up this wall, and ironically, it's to kind of move beyond that. But we need to let that wall down. Accept your role as mother. Let the wall down. Accept your, ro your role as a very important uh, individual, perhaps the most important, of your household. And embrace it and be there for your children in ways that you've never been before. Let the walls down. Accept it. And I think that's what we're talking about here. I'm going to keep reading this. Back into the middle of page 12. Authenticity required it. Things like Greta's poems, things that did not flow right out, were suspect, even scorned. Of course, she went right on doing as she did, fussing and probing, secretly though, as nails on the counterculture. But at the moment, her child surrendered to Greg and to whatever he did. And Greta was entirely grateful. All religiously infused words. Uh, Greta was grateful for the kind of learning that she's getting uh, from Greg, the lessons that she's uh, learning from him. Okay. So from this page, Greta realizes that she should surrender herself entirely to the act of giving and the act of giving to Katie. Um, and that goes back to one of those questions that I asked before. Is poetry an act of giving or selfishness? It does seem at this point that she realizes she has to kind of give up the poetry if she's going to be able to wholeheartedly uh, and completely give to Katie the way that she needs to be, because she has this new idea of what it means to give. Um, I don't think it's just being physically present, it's everything else that you could imagine here. Okay, good. On this page, um, we'll read a lot more religious stuff taking place here. Uh, this is right at the top of 13. He told her that he had got into acting by way of his religion. His family belonged to some Christian sect Greta had never heard of. This sect was not large but very rich, or at least some of the members were. This is almost the direct opposite of the Dakabors that we talked about earlier in the sense that this sect of Christianity is incredibly wealthy. Doesn't even tell us which, what it is exactly. But remember, the Dakabors uh, essentially res, um, prohibited wealth. Uh, they... Uh, scorned materialism because again they're back to the original teachings of Christ not based on the uh, you know some version of interpretation by the institution of the church his uh, so moving on they had built a church with a theater in it in a town of the prairies so this rich 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 sect of Christianity builds a theater a theater now we're thinking about that literary circle and the writers that Greta was involved with uh, earlier in the text in contrast to the Dakabors, right? This is all indulgence and money and wealth. They did parables. Uh, I'm sorry, that was where he started to act before he was 10 years old. They did parables from the Bible, but also present day ones about the awful things that happened to people who didn't believe what they did. His family was very proud of him. And of course, so he, w so he was of himself. He wouldn't dream of telling them all that went on when the rich converts came to renew their vows and get revitalized in their holiness. Anyway, he really liked getting all the approval, and he liked the acting. So 
he does break away from this. He, he's going to tell his family he's no longer going to be doing this theater for this, uh, this very wealthy Christian sect, but he did like the approval that came from it. There might be some correlation to Christ here. Uh, I don't know enough about, you know, the... Uh, the history of Christ leading up to the crucifixion, you know, the, the years of his life, the decades of his life uh, preceding that, maybe the idea was he did uh, kind of rise through the ranks uh, of some kind of wealthy uh, enterprise, uh, loved the adoration that he was receiving, but then turned his back on it and recognized that wasn't for him. I'm not sure. Uh, we would have to look that up to be very, uh, to be very um, clear. We also find some information here about Greta's relationship uh, with her uh, grandmother. And then it gets into kind of Peter's, feeling, uh, Peter's feelings about religion as well, and it gets into a little bit of contrast between Catholics and Christians. I'll just read this quickly and then my notes. Peter didn't understand all that. His mother never went to church, though she had carried him through the mountains that she, and presumably he, could be Catholics. He said Catholics probably had an advantage. You could hedge your bets right until you were, die, uh, you were dying. So there is some idea of Catholic versus Protestant here, um, which I won't necessarily comment on. Uh, this was the first time she had thought of Peter in a while. So the first thing, the, Peter's been off her mind all this time as she's been on this train trip uh, traveling to Toronto with Katie. But now that all this kind of religious sentimentality, or at least this kind of religious uh, uh, deliberation is upon her, now she starts to think of Peter. Uh, in other words, the rock, right? The steadiness there. This probably does factor into that whole idea is good is good enough, or uh, but you'd have to be articulate those connections. It would take a little bit more time than what we're going to uh, think about in this lecture. This is where it becomes uh, quite quite interesting, uh, quite strange. We do know that they uh, she does cheat on her husband with Greg. Now, on a literal level, it is adultery. We understand this, uh, and she is to uh, she's going to have to kind of you know bear this with her, whether or not she feels guilt or not. That's going to be her own uh, decision to make. Um, but one thing uh, is we can look at it figuratively. So when she cheats with this guy Greg, and they actually get into this role play, which is really strange. Uh, he takes on uh, the name Reg or Reggie, and Reggie uh, translates to powerful ruler. So he takes on this 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 role as powerful ruler, and uh, she takes on the role of Dorothy, and Dorothy translates to gift of God. Uh, so again, some of that religious uh, symbolism uh, continues uh, to factor in here. So on a figurative level, maybe she is having an intimate relationship with Jesus. So not necessarily sexual, which is one way you could look at it, obviously on a literal level, uh, but this is more figurative that she's having this uh, affair with Jesus, which maybe means that she's kind of coming to grips with what he represents and she can start to apply these ideas to her own life and the outlook that she has on herself and her marriage here. And I, I tend to look at it more figuratively than I do literally. but. There's always two ways of looking at these stories. That's what's nice about them. Um, she even says here at the uh, top of 14, certainly not, what kind of beast do you think I am? Of course, she's in a role play. And beast, if we're talking about all this religious symbolism, you might as well talk about 666 and the mark of the beast, uh, which is originally kind of intended for Judas, the person who betrays Christ in his time of need. Uh, but six also represents the imperfections of men and women. Right? Uh, again, uh, men and women were created on the sixth day, according to kind of biblical narrative, uh, and therefore the imperfections of man going back with Genesis and Adam and Eve even you know all these you know all these things um, so the word beast really stands out there there's another motif here I'll be quick about this one uh, it's mentioned that a lot of people like to go into the big dome car on the train so I imagine it's a it's a, a train car and it's just got a big dome on it uh, and it's really to take pictures and sightsee and see all of the uh, scenery uh, that is passing by and one thing you can see from this dome car is the mountain uh, in the distance and you know again when we talk about a mountain here especially with some of this religious stuff we've been talking about it is this idea of ascent and elevation and maybe trying to look out uh, to the truth of God or the clarity of God so that could be the idea there um, they start to have sex and a little bit of foreplay I'll read this uh, this is halfway down on 14 In Greg's untidy quarters, they took up where they had left off. 
There was no room for two people to lie down properly, but they managed to roll over each other. At first, no end of stifled laughter, then the great shocks of pleasure. Shocks of pleasure is a bit oxymoronic. You wouldn't think that pleasure would come as a shock, which makes me think that maybe uh, uh, the pleasure is being negatively portrayed here. With, uh, with no place to look but into each other's wide eyes, biting each other to hold in some ferocious noise. This seems incredibly beastly and anim uh, animalistic uh, here, uh, and it does feel like they are surrendering to some beastly and primitive, perhaps even poetic impulse. This might be the venting that she needed, and here Christ is kind of giving it to her in a very strange way. You could say, if Christ gives and gives and gives, I will give you this indulgence that you need so that you can learn to get over it and I can put you at rest so that you can attend your responsibilities uh, with your child, right? And give the way that I give. So I don't, on a figurative level, I think we can see this as a, not, I guess you, it obviously is a catharsis, but it's her way of venting. Um, back to what I was saying, on a figurative level, um, it seems like this is the release that she needed and the release is coming with the aid of Christ, or at least a figure that represents the idea of Christ, uh, especially as he role plays uh, and takes on the figure of Reg, which is powerful ruler, uh, which in many respects you could say uh, is Christ as well. Okay, very good. And she's letting that beast out of her right now. She's letting it out in the act of this, uh, uh, of having sex uh, with Greg. But of course, they're in a role play all the way up until the end, right? Okay, this gets into... Um, she likens herself also, at the bottom of 14, she likens herself to a gladiator, interestingly enough. Uh, it says, she got herself decent and left him. Actually, she didn't much care uh, who met her. She was weak, shocked, like, uh, but buoyant, like some gladiator. She actually thought this out and smiled at it after a session in the arena. And that's one of the questions we have for you is, why do we get the simile of gladiator, right? What has she battled? And another question, what has she survived? And we start to do some articulation here. Good. Then she goes back and her daughter is missing. This is the great punishment, right? She overindulged. She finally did it. She had sex with Greg. She, she kind of, you know, went outside of her marriage for this. And it does have an immediate consequence. And that immediate consequence is Katie has left her. Katie, in other words, purity and cleansliness has left her. You see how that symbolism matches up perfectly? It has left her in this moment, right? Uh, it is a result. It is a consequence. Um, she finds herself revisiting and reevaluating the vast distance of time uh, before she had had sex with Greg. And she wants to stop at that moment. Going all the way back, she wants to stop at that moment and she never wants to move. So all of this is to say she highly regrets uh, what she's done here, right? And that's, uh, that's occurring about midway on 15. And it's not just the physical leaving, right, that she's physically left her daughter uh, in uh, this, uh, you know, uh, compartment. Uh, it's that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an, a bigger betrayal. Uh, it's an emotional abandonment. It's a spiritual abandonment as well. So it's not just the physical. It's the fact that she has left her daughter emotionally uh, and spiritually as well. And this is always, like I said in the very beginning of this lecture, this is the image that sticks with me. Uh, the fact that where does she find Katie? Where does she find purity and cleansliness? She finds her daughter right in between the two train cars. And I'm going to read this really quickly. A new fear then. Supposing Katie had made her way to one end of the car on the other and actually managed to get a door open or followed a person who had opened it ahead of her. Between the cars, there was a short walkway where you were actually walking over the place where the cars joined up. Bridge. This is the second bridge, a uh, very literal, clear bridge that we have in this text. There, you could feel the train's motion in a sudden and alarming way. 
A heavy door behind and another in front and on either side of the walkway clanging metal plates. These covered the steps that were let down when the train was stopped. Greta always hurried through these passages, where the banging and swaying reminded her how things were put together in a way that seemed not so inevitable after all. What she's talking about here is her life, right? Life is always going to be on a bridge like the one being described here. Um, banging and swaying. And Greta's way of kind of dealing with this aspect of life, the unfortunate aspects, the banging, the swaying, your mind telling you that good is not good enough and you deserve better and uh, you're being victimized this way and persecuted this way and this is what you need to do and all of this noise, her way of dealing with this was to just scoot right on through and not to endure this kind of feeling in her life. Moving on. Almost casual yet in too much of a hurry, that banging and swaying. The banging and swaying. It is the internal conflict that Greta has about her life, her marriage, her purpose, etc. And this is rushed, irrational, premeditated even. Right? Um, she never in a sustainable way considered if one's best is really good enough for her husband, for her, or for their relationship. What Greta needs to learn to do, and she's going to observe this through Katie, who will be essentially sitting very quietly on this little bridge, uh, in you know, this noisy, bangy, swaying bridge in between these two train cars, what Greta's going to realize is, I need to do that as well. I need to be able in to endure uh, the unsettling parts of my life and have the patience. And she's going to learn this uh, through seeing her daughter uh, on, uh, in this uh, spot, in this spot. So Katie was not hurt at all. This is page 16. Katie was not hurt at all. Her clothes hadn't caught as they might have on the shifting sharp edges of the metal plates. Katie is able to hold it together in this area. She is unaffected by the banging and swaying, unlike Greta, and therefore Greta can learn from her daughter. Her daughter, like I said, seems to possess a maturity that Greta can only wish for. Um, her, her, the, the irony is that Greta is more of a child in the sense of overindulging and always you know, lashing out against unsettling matters in her life, whereas Katie, uh, this purity and this innocence, as I always kind of say here, or at least this purity and cleansliness, is able to endure uh, this type uh, of feeling. She's able to move on from it. She's able to push through it. Um, <laughs> Katie. Katie thought Greta might have been on the stairs in the dome car, meaning she was actually kind of going in the direction of God. And of course, we understand symbolically that that's not the case. She was not there, right? But that's where Katie thought her mom would be. Uh, so symbolically, that's pretty interesting. So uh, ascending to the dome in the eternal mountains, right? Mom, I thought you were going to be there. That's not quite where Greta's at now, but maybe she's learning that's where she could be. Uh, it goes on to say, Greta covered her with her blanket in their birth, and it was then that she began to shake, as if she had a fever. She felt sick. This is Greta. She felt sick and tasted vomit in her throat. That vomit could be the guilt and the impurity that she has uh, kind of... Um uh, that she has received based on her act. Uh, Katie said, don't push me and squirmed away. You smell bad, she said. So it's almost like she has a sixth sense here uh, about her mother. Um, Katie's situation on the train is uh, an analogy to Greta's situation in a stale marriage in which poetry is the lure uh, to personal satisfaction. Okay, I'll just read this. Just a few more minutes here. Someone would have found Katie, surely. Some decent person, not an evil person, would have spotted her there and carried her to where it was safe. Greta would have heard the dismaying announcement, news that a child had been found alone on the train. A child who gave her name as Katie. Greta would have rushed, having got herself decent, she would have rushed to claim her child and lied, saying that she had just gone to the ladies' room. She would have been frightened, but she would have been spared the picture she had now of Katie sitting in that noisy space, helpless between the cars, not crying, not complaining. That's the key, right? Not crying, not complaining, dealing with it. As if she was just to sit there for an offer to her, no hope. Her eyes had been oddly without expression and her mouth just hanging open in the moment before the fake fact of rescue struck her and she could begin to cry. She only begins to cry when she realizes she's been rescued. But other than that, she endures. 
the entire experience in that car. Only then she could retrieve her word, her right to suffer and complain. After that, after she has this, uh, essentially this revelation and this realization, uh, Greta and Katie went to the dome car to spend the rest of the afternoon. They had it mostly to themselves, so they have this entire train car where it basically represents an acknowledgement of God. The people taking pictures had worn themselves out in the Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountains is interesting because Peter uh, is rock or stone, and so maybe that's a reference to Peter. And as Greg had commented, the prairies uh, left them flat. Meaning, you know, all people really wanted to see, I guess in some respects, was God uh, in the mountains, right? or at least the, the, the brilliance of the mountains. But once it was just flat prairies or kind of staleness or just, you know, good is just good enough, like just deal with it, just look at the scenery. It, so what if it's not these amazing, illustrious mountains? That's when people leave. So we're essentially kind of criticizing these people in a figurative sense uh, that all we want is the tremendously amazing things we're not willing to kind of suffer through or at least endure through or deal with in patience things that are not so amazing in our lives, right? We always feel as if it needs to be better, maybe now more than ever. I mean, this story was published, I think, some time ago, especially now with the world of social media and you know, short attention spans and instant gratification. Maybe now, especially, good is never, ever good enough. Uh, and that could be a kind of more general question uh, that we get to discuss as a class here. All right, people, last couple pages here. So, um, Greg gets off the train. This is at the top of 17. Greta saw him greeted by a couple uh, who must have been his parents, also by a woman in a wheelchair, probably a grandmother, and then by several younger people who were hanging about cheerful and embarrassed. Um, none of them look like members of a sect or like people who are strict and disagreeable in any way. So there's, it almost feels like uh, there's a cripple there, uh, young people. It feels like it's Christ's entourage. So it almost feels like Greg gets off the, the train, characterized uh, you know, continuously uh, as Christ, and he's got a lot of people there waiting for him, which is uh, interesting. Katie can't find him. It says Katie found it too difficult to look for him or else she didn't try. Um, she turned away with a proper and slightly offended look, and Greg, after one last antic wave, turned too. Greta wondered if the child could be punishing him for desertion, refusing to miss or even acknowledge him. So, oh, Katie's kind of got a... Katie's guard seems to be back up here uh, at the end of the text. So, I wouldn't say that Katie is a static character uh, through and through. There might be some slight character changes that she's experiencing uh, as we lead up to the end. Middle of uh, 17... The narration reads, and this is all first-person narration coming from uh, Greta, it says, all right, if that's the way it was going to be, forget it. Uh, almost saying, accept, just accept things the way that they're happening here. All right, if that was the way it was going to be, forget it. A little bit, uh, second paragraph from the bottom on 17. All her, all her walking, oh, I'm sorry, all her waking time for these hundreds of miles had been devoted to Katie. Greta knew that such devotion on her part had never shown itself before. The experience she's had with Greg, her child disappearing, the frantic, uh, you know, act of looking for her child, the time spent with her child afterward. All of this has led to a devotion on her part that she had never seen before, she had never noticed before. Back into the text, it was true uh, that she had cared for her child, dressed her, fed her, talked to her during those hours when they were together and Peter was at work, but Greta had other things to do around the house and her attention had been spasmodic, her, ten her tenderness often tactical. Beautiful way of expressing uh, or describing parenthood generally, right, in the first place. But here's the idea. If all that's on your mind is, I gotta write poetry, uh, I have to poetically express, I have to be a part of this world, I have to make it, I have to compete. If your mind is even halfway always going in that direction, then what's going toward your child? What authentic feeling and, and real meaning of being there is actually being given to your child? According to Greta, not much because she's having quite a revelation at this point that she needs to give more entirely. And I think she's starting to see this indulgence with poetry as a sin, uh, believe it or not, right? Because it's taking her away from something much more important. 
being there takes on a whole new meaning. It means catering to a cleanness and purity, such as Katie, not just physical, but psychological and uh, spiritual. So this isn't a, I wouldn't call this an epiphany because losing your child is not an epiphany. Epiphanies are small things that occur that lead to giant revelations. This is probably more of a catharsis uh, that she's experiencing. Um, we can hold grudges, especially for being deserted. Uh, we don't have to necessarily get over it. Um, but I guess the question is, what, is, what, is, what does Greta feel she's been deserted by? Uh, I guess is one of the questions. Okay, the last page. This is where we have the, the very abrupt ending. Uh, we get the mention of sin here at the very top of the page. The metal clatter between the cars where Katie was uh, kind of waiting for her mother right after she had kind of went looking for her. Notice that Katie goes looking for her mother firstly, right? She thought she'd be on the stairs at the dome. Um, that metal clatter is likened to poetry. Uh, so it's not, it says right here, Katie sitting there amid the metal clatter between the cars. Poetry was something else Greta was going to have to give up. So by thinking about her daughter there, she knows that she has to give up the poetry. And then she calls that poetry, or the indulgence in that poetry, she calls it a sin, the inattention. Cold-hearted foraging attention to something else than a child, a sin. And that's quite declarative. I think we've, we've kind of hit upon the point, uh, the social commentary being presented uh, by the author uh, and the main crux of conflict, uh, and I guess you could say resolution of the conflict, for Greta. This indulgence in poetry is a sin because it's taking her away from her child. Which leads us, so I'll just say a couple things. Poetry is the metal clatter between the cars, a danger to her daughter who is all alone on the no, on the, uh, in the motion. Uh, good is not good enough, her marriage, right? That's the danger, this feeling that good is not good enough. Wonder, wonderful point. I mean, really, you think about applications to your own life and people that you know, people who are just not satisfied, and does that lead to more harm than not? Uh, it's an interesting question. Okay, this just leads to the very end here. Um, they come out of a dark tunnel and there's the light. Again, you can look at that kind of in a very general way, kind of religiously, uh, that we've kind of sprung into a world of optimism and we've come out of this long darkness. Uh, the extension of her life up to this point, the long distance that Greta has traveled up to this point through all this darkness, has this big uh, kind of catharsis, this revelation, and boom, we're in this world of light. But then who's waiting for her at the end of this? Harris, and I'll just read it. Um, this is the very end. They walked up a ramp and there was an escalator. Katie halted, so Greta did too, till people got by them. Then Greta picked Katie up and set her on her hip and managed the suitcase with the other arm, stooping and bumping it on the moving steps. At the top she put the child down and they were able to hold hands again in the bright lofty uh, light of Union Station. There the people who had been walking in front of them began to peel off to be claimed by the people who were waiting and who called out their names or who simply walked uh, up and took hold of their suitcases. The idea, you know, this idea to be claimed by someone. As someone now took hold of theirs, took hold of it, took hold of Greta and kissed her for the first time, here finally comes that kiss. Finally, we get that kiss in a determined and celebratory way. Harris, first a shock, not good, because we had the shock with the sex earlier. Then a tumbling in Greta's insides, an immense settling. She was trying to hang on to Katie, but at that moment the child pulled away. She got her hand free. The idea is that Katie does not want to get in the middle uh, of this relationship, uh, this idea between Greta and Harris. But then it says she didn't try to escape she just stood. So it's not like she's getting away completely. Whereas Greta, you could say, is trying to escape this, this whole idea of being in this family, right? This whole idea of being a mother or being a wife to Peter. She's been trying to escape all this time, but not Katie. She didn't try to escape. She just stood, downcast, waiting for whatever had to come next. Patience, enduring, much like she did on the train uh, in the rattling section uh, in between those uh, train cars. Enduring, waiting for what was going to come next. Right? She knows the lesson of giving 
This is Katie I'm talking about. She knows the lesson of giving and embodies it to the end. Uh, she knows or intuits that she is secondary. My mom needs to uh, indulge in this kind of you know, fantasy, uh, this extramarital affair. I'm going to give her that space to do so, but I'm not going to run away completely. This is the same way that Peter is described at the beginning before they set off on this train trip in the first place. Uh, where he is uh, giving them the space they need, but still standing there much like a rock, uh, kind of a foundation of some kind, uh, he's not going to go anywhere. It seems like she is over this. This is Greta I'm talking about. Uh, it seems like she is over this, like she has learned a new perspective, but spontaneously, uh, here comes Harris, which is like that echo. We talked earlier about kind of an echo being, you know, how do you respond to an echo? Well, here, here it comes. Uh, she wanted this quite some time ago. Uh, it was on her mind, and now he's shown up, but it seems like she's not really yearning for this any longer. This Harris is her indulgence, and here it is, eager and ready, and what in the world is she going to do or say to this guy uh, now that he has arrived? Okay, uh, we, uh, you know, just on a literal level, too, you understand that she was going to house it for a friend in Toronto, and we also know that Harris lives in Toronto, uh, so he somehow knew that she was coming to town. We could find the exact uh, uh, you know, factual evidence for that as well. Uh, this story is uh, quite amazing. I think it's one of the best short stories I've read in some time, and uh, hopefully we can go even further with um, some of the themes uh, and even some of the conflicts that we pointed, up, pointed out up to this point. Thank you.